the title screen that we've been looking at here. Um, uh, I just love the idea that uh, you guys are out there sowing the seeds of victory uh, every season and uh, that the possibility that every garden can be a munition plant. Uh, and this is an idea that, you know, was, you know, you're doing the, the, your active duty by uh, supplying the, the war effort back in World War II. Um, and we'll touch base on some of that. Um, and just like how important it is to garden, I'm kind of like a vicarious gardener. My grandparents had a massive garden that I loved and uh, I never really quite got the patch of land I needed to do it myself, but I'm working on that. Um, anyway, uh, in the middle here, uh, Fernside um, was one of the last uh, surviving active uh, agricultural uh, efforts that later became an entire neighborhood of homes. Um, and here we have uh, ABC, um, Alfred B. Cohen, uh, coming through the rye in Fernside. And we'll talk about why he and his family were so important to Alameda's history. Um, and uh, all right, so let's just dive right into this thing. And uh, hopefully this will work. Ago, but I don't remember him too well. Um, the, uh, starting with the original state of the uh, peninsula, right? Alameda was originally attached to the mainland and it had this gorgeous stand of oak trees that was unlike any other um, in the nation other than probably the one in Oakland, just across the way there. And it has to do with the sand we have here. It's like quaternary sand that blows over from the San Francisco Peninsula and lands here and makes it possible for these trees to thrive. I mean, that it, there isn't quite the right mix in San Francisco. It's not the right climate just right here for these trees and they did amazingly well. Um, also you see there listed the many kinds of flowers um, that uh, grew here naturally, blackberries, oats, mushrooms, um, and various types of uh, pests, plants I guess. Um, and uh, poison oak was such a problem especially when they started chopping down the trees. It allowed the poison oak to spread more easily became a big problem, especially along the railroad where people were sometimes, you know, walking and the, the, the one cleared out part of the peninsula was when the railroad came through and uh, there was tons of poison oak between the tracks and eventually 1894 they made it illegal to have poison oak on your property. So I sure hope you don't have any. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, probably don't. Um, the uh, Live Oak Trees Running Away brings up a quote I'd like to read you from this fantastic book, uh, Imelda Merlin's uh, Geographical History of Alameda. If you haven't read this, you probably should. It's more than you ever wanted to know, especially about the soil. I mean, they even have a, a soil reading from uh, the uh, this study they did in at Alameda High School. You guys would probably dig it. Oh, watch it. I do a lot of those gardening puns. Um, anyways, uh, Here's the quote. Trees stand everywhere, interspersed in wild fields and have a determined look. There are so many trees that you can't see the place. It gives the general feeling that everyone is camping out. They are scattered everywhere, bending low and spreading their branches wide so you can almost live in them. They have a great fancy for twisting and turning, which must be their own wild nature. When I look on great fields of them, I feel that I am in the midst of a storm. Everything has such a windswept look. One day I came upon a body of them that appeared as if they had all been stopped by some enchantment in the midst of running away. The foliage is light and does not obscure their muscular look. This was from Carolyn Layton, who arrived in Alameda in 1878, giving her impressions of early Alameda. And you can see again the, the trees here that were kept uh, on Fernside uh, much longer than other parts of the island. But we'll get to that later. Uh, the natural fauna, the uh, birds, uh, uh, plenty, uh, the tremendous list of creatures that once found their homes here, uh, very few of which, uh, I guess, uh, well, no, whatever. <laughs> these big guys don't really make it around much anymore, but, you know, uh, plenty of these birds still do. And um, this great illustration from the Ohlone Way uh, just captures like the huge proliferation of birds. I was always so impressed by this one particular picture. But, um, you know, if you ever pick up that book, that's another great book to read, The Ohlone Way by uh, uh, Mark Lynn, I believe his name is. But anyway, um, there it is. Yeah, Malcolm Margolin. That's why I put those notes in here so I don't have to remember. 
Okay, next slide. Uh, yeah, so speaking of the Native Americans, the Ohlone tribe that once lived here, I mean, Alameda was a form of paradise. And I mean, there was like plenty of opportunity uh, to get sustenance here. There's fresh water regularly, uh, springs, uh, or spring, natural springs that occurred in the artesian wells that uh, were possible here. Um, the uh, oysters and grasshoppers, uh, these were just, you know, natural things that they knew how to harvest in great amounts and never really ran out of food. Um, the, uh, the, there was, <laughs> this is something that's like totally relevant right now, is that Native Americans regularly burned areas of grasses to um, encourage seed production and they could also kind of round up all those grasshoppers and eat them all at once and all already roasted. Uh, and there was a technique to it. It wasn't just random. Um, and you got to read about it. It's way cool, a lonely way. Um, yeah, berries, clover, seaweed. There was tons to eat here. And uh, the other thing that was way cool is this soap plant. I mean, the most fascinating plant is this soap plant, the chlorogollum. I don't know if any of you guys, uh, heart, you know, propagate this thing. <laughs> It's probably a weed, but um, the thing is, it, it's an edible root. Uh, somehow you can break it down and make glue and attach arrowheads to the shaft. Um, you can make brushes and brooms from the, uh, the fuzzy part there. And uh, met, it had medicinal properties, as you can see, and it was used to stun fish. So here's the thing. If you have a little pond full of fish or some kind of enclosed area, um, that you can like net them in or keep them in an area and then toss this onion into the, into the pond, they'll be stunned by this antiseptic property of the onion and rise to the top and you just scoop the fish up. You don't have to, you don't have to bait no hook. I mean, that's amazing, the things they knew just uh, to take advantage of what was in front of them without having to totally deplete it at the same time. But whatever, uh, that's, I'm getting on my soapbox. Uh, when the uh, Americans arrived, um, I'm kind of fast forwarding over the Rancho era because what happened then is uh, Antonio Peralta, the first uh, European settler who owned Alameda, um, <clears throat> had a giant ranch of cattle and horse. And uh, he, he found that occasionally his, uh, his cattle would wander down to the bolso, as he called it, the bolso, I believe the purse, um, which was a description of the original shape of Alameda's uh, peninsula, and said that uh, his cattle were getting lost in the, in the woods down there. And that wasn't surprising when I, you know, described all those oaks or whatever. Apparently, even the early residents of Alameda got lost in those oak trees. Um, which caused uh, lighting to be one of the first priorities of the early city fathers, but that's uh, maybe a story for another time. Um, anyway, so if you check out this map here on the right, you'll see there's these small, um, small lots uh, at the lower right that uh, the original founders, Chipman and Augenbaugh, William Worthington Chipman, Gideon Augenbaugh, were the original owners of this peninsula. They bought it from uh, Peralta. I shouldn't say they're the original owners. What am I saying? Peralta owned it, but they were the, the, the first, I guess, Americans to own uh, the Alameda Peninsula because both of these gentlemen came from back east and came out here during the gold rush. And uh, they, they purchased land here, Augenbaugh with the intention of being a, 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 or, or growing in his, his own orchard and doing horticultural experiments and then selling his produce in his San Francisco grocery. And uh, Chipman was really more of the civic minded fellow who wanted to see, you know, Alameda blossom into a, a county seat or something fantastic. Uh, and uh, he was probably more involved in selling these residential lots at the lower right. And uh, the longer lots that you see, and let me get you oriented here. I mean, I don't know if you, can you guys see my mouse? I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to indicate with my mouse, but I don't know if you can see that. We can see the mouse. Oh, great. Okay, so right there is uh, the world headquarters of the Alameda Sun, uh, Ensenal Avenue and High Street. Uh, the uh, High Street Shopping Center is uh, is right there, or the uh, Ensenal Shopping Center, rather, sorry. 
Um, <laughs> only go there like every day. Uh, anyways, uh, and you can see uh, these longer lots here are intended to be orchard lots. So um, eventually these uh, subdivisions would become, uh, you know, roads like Sterling Avenue and uh, um, Briggs Avenue is down here named for one of the original uh, orchard owners there. And so the reason why these lots are, are designed like that is for long rows of trees. Um, and you can see that this is on an 1878 map of Alameda uh, by uh, Thompson and Friends. Um, okay, so the first lots sold were, were these orchards and these small homesteads. And uh, Chip and Nogobo had such trouble getting people to Alameda through all this marsh down here and uh, that they, uh, they ended up giving away free watermelons just to get people to look. <laughs> Um, and uh, I guess back in the day, uh, that was a pretty expensive thing because food, uh, you know, sold for, for good money back when uh, it was more scarce in the early days of the gold rush. Anyways, um, I was talking to uh, somebody who lives down here um, about why their uh, intersection is so awkward. And uh, part of the reason is because back in the day when Chipman had the town surveyed, right around Versailles, Versailles Avenue, whatever you prefer, uh, that street, uh, the, the chains got caught on the underbrush and messed up the surveyor's drawing somehow. And that's why we end up with this strange uh, angle and the folks live down there and they have a, a patch of city land they get to garden on, I guess, partly because of this awkwardness. Um, and also because the streetcar would eventually cut through there. So that's a story for another show. Anyways, we got to move right along here. So uh, there's uh, famous landowners here. Briggs has a street named after him. A. A. Cohen, the railroad baron. We're going to talk lots about him later. And you can't really see it. I'm sorry, but that's Pater Sather. Um, owned some pieces of property here. One of the uh, uh, original uh, you know, benefactors of UC Berkeley, Sather Gate, Sather Tower, named for him. And of course, just a quick run through of what Chippen and Augenbaugh did agriculturally. Their first orchards, uh, peach, apple, and cherry. Peach Street on the east end is no mistake. That was where their peach orchard was. Um, various forms of apples they brought in here, peaches, Coolidge's favorite, you know, whoever that was. Oh, and then we get to ride a train through the orchards with the Melda. Um, Okay, here's a quote, uh, even as late, uh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, this is 1884. In February, the almond trees appear in full bloom. Then comes the cherry with its white blossoms, then the plum, pear, and the peach, the apple, the quince, to keep up the magnificent floral display into the middle of April. The fig and lemon and orange flourish also. That was that written in the paper, um, 1884. Um, uh, but, uh, that, that's a little bit later on, but uh, the, uh, when Chipman and Augenbaugh were there in the 1850s and 60s, um, Augenbaugh actually did some horticultural experiments where he invented his own blackberry, today named the Augenbaugh blackberry. And I don't know too much about this stuff, but I read at least in one place that uh, Augenbaugh's uh, blackberry is the industry standard in terms of like breeding new blackberries. So like if you, this is like the best one you can get. And if you want to like build off that, you should use Augenbaugh's blackberry. And it turns out this fellow named Judge Logan did just that and invented a new berry called the Loganberry. And I don't know if you guys know anything about the Loganberry, but uh, the odd thing about it is it has a special place in my heart because it's one of the, the last things that I talked with my grandfather about in that garden I was telling you about at the beginning. Uh, we were picking some weird ass berry and I'm like, grandpa, what is this? I've never seen this kind of berry. And he goes, oh, that's a Logan berry. I'm like, really? I know, they did some weird uh, experiments in my, uh, of their own, my grandparents. Anyways, uh, so uh, the, an interesting story about uh, the top part of Park Street. Now, uh, you can see here on this early map, um, 1852, that Chipman and Augenbaugh had some early partners. 
and uh, they owned the far west end and the far east end of the peninsula. And this gives you an idea of the original landform and all that. Um, but one of these borders here, I believe this one between uh, Hayes and Foley's land became Park Street. And when you have a piece of property and you want to increase the value, you make the border into a road and then sell the, sub, the, the properties on either side. And Mr. Pankos uh, was one of these guys who, uh, this is his home here. It's located uh, you know, somewhere up in here. And he had a giant strawberry patch up there. And the strawberry patch continued like well up into the, what was called the Ensenal and lands adjacent, which was over here on Hibbert's property. Three early towns originally comprised Alameda. Um, and uh, that's probably a story for another show too. But anyways, um, what was happening is that while these guys uh, supposedly owned the land, there's this whole culture of squatting going on. And people are squatting on Antonio Peralta's land over here in Oakland and in many other places where uh, Mexicans owned land, Americans treated that with no respect and just kind of like plopped down and said, they're not doing anything with this land, so I'm gonna claim it. Soon enough, American courts made that legal and guess what? It started happening to Chipman and Ogamaw and these other guys who all bought in with their own money to actually purchase these pieces of property. Their fellow Americans came over and squatted on their land and just took it. And Hibbert even encouraged this kind of thing. Anyway, so the 1853 potato crop was that a particular guy uh, squatted on somebody else's land. I think it was Fitch. And Fitch paid the guy, uh, say, uh, $200 to quit the land. Okay, get off this. It's really my land. I'll give you $200 to leave. The guy takes the $200, fine. I'll quit the land. It turns out there was potatoes planted on that property worth $300 or something. I'm making the numbers up. But it was something like that where the guy actually made a profit on the, the food that was grown, which again, in the 1850s, California the population exploded and things like a peach could sell for a dollar. So <clears throat> something like a potato crop could be very valuable. And uh, C.C. Bowman, early settler on the West End, I just mentioned that uh, there's in the record of him having his pigs and cows stolen um, as part of this squatter culture. And we'll just note these palm trees for later. In general, uh, in the East Bay, when you're looking for history, you can use the palm tree method, and uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, okay, uh, Gold Rush era bay farmers, uh, th these are the early settlers on Bay Farm, uh, probably a grand total of about 30 people in, in these families. And uh, they reached these acres that were uh, very uh, arable, um, via a road that would get washed out at high tide because Bay Farm Island back in the day was an island at high tide. And at low tide, this marshland became exposed and extremely difficult to get over here, but still they uh, managed to pull it off and uh, uh, continually have the city rebuild the road um, every time it got washed out. I can get it over with. <laughs> right, so, um, all of these folks have uh, streets named for them out there, thanks to uh, our intrepid uh, Alameda Museum curator, George Gunn. Um, and uh, the, uh, let's see, what else can we say about it? Down here, the, the major landowner was actually Amos McCartney, who owned a small piece, uh, uh, I mean, a small, he raised a small piece of dry land about here to build his homestead, and then proceeded to have all this marshland reclaimed. And we have this amazing picture of his wharf that he built. Um, and this kind of gives you an idea of like, I don't know, it's, it's hard to see, but this is like the rugged rock border that caused the marshland to be dried out over here. And then they could actually try to grow something there, which I suppose is what they were doing. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it, he eventually became the largest landowner um, on Bay Farm once he reclaimed all that, and his point was to, to grow crops there. 
Um, so various farming techniques were used here in Alameda. They're on the record, thanks to Imelda and other folks. Um, and uh, there's a, in, uh, some weird stuff about um, using uh, hand irrigation as opposed to horses. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'm sorry. I, I meant to look this up a little bit better, but um, apparently like it was more effective for them to to do it by hand in some places. Um, the artesian well was uh, a natural phenomenon that uh, occurred both on Bay Farm and the main island that the early farmers did take advantage of to get uh, irrigation. And you can see here that like the, the pressure from the Oakland Hills more or less <clears throat> um, allows for water to pop out of the aquifer down here. And there were artesian wells along Thompson Avenue that's why there's a median in the middle of Thompson Avenue, in the middle of Christmas Tree Lane, as we know, where Santa hangs out. That's because that used to be uh, an entire waterworks there. And they would pipe the water to uh, Park Street and store it there. That's another story for another show. Um, neighbors produce fertilizer. Oh, yeah, because you have dairies around. Um, I'm sure there's some trading happening. Um, <laughs> I think you know what I'm, what I'm hitting out there. Um, you can actually get three crop cycles in Alameda and, um, and then of course the, uh, the truck farming on at Bay Farm, which uh, apparently all that just means is that you didn't sell the produce there on your farmland. You trucked it to some kind of produce market, which is uh, the produce market in Oakland that everybody's very familiar with. So um, yeah. So that was uh, some, some various things about farming here that they did. Um, these are some other random tidbits like uh, Dr. Henry Haley is on record as getting uh, a, 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 a monopoly on early knit Canadian peas. And I hope you guys know what those are. I, actually know. I, mean, I just think of peas as peas. I'm sure there's a million kinds, but the early knit Canadian peas, he was the only one in Alameda that grew them and, and he was like holding down that market. So I don't know, this must have been pretty special. Um, Reverend Bishop Taylor was the first uh, person to introduce the eucalyptus tree to the Bay Area, the legend goes, and his family lived in Alameda. Um, his wife, uh, planted this uh, eucalyptus tree. This is supposedly, the best guess we have is, right now this is where uh, KFC is. Or one of the corners there uh, with Park Avenue. Um, oh no, wait, it's not KFC. Maybe I'm a block off. No, no. It's, uh, it's the place that used to be Gallagher and Lindsay and then it's across the street. It's like a city housing uh, nowadays. Um, but it's on the corner of Park Ave, and I guess that's Central. And uh, yeah, so this this tree, the Bishop Taylor tree, was actually a city landmark, the first eucalyptus tree planted in California. And it got chopped down when it tangled with this Chevron, uh, the Chevron's uh, under, underground gas tank. Um, so even though it was a city landmark, uh, it had to go. Um, Gold Rush era hay, $75 ton, various uh, uh, prices, just to give you an idea of how valuable just everyday agricultural products were back then. Um, okay, proof of Alameda's fertility. If it was in the newspaper, it had to be true, right? So uh, Encinal, uh, one of the city's oldest papers, it actually, there was one other newspaper before it that it bought out, bought after its first edition, the Alameda Post or something like that. The Daily Encinal gets into action with editor A.K. Krauth, and uh, they found uh, in 1870 was grown a 120 pound squash, seven six pound onions without irrigation, 20 inch carrots, three inch diameter asparagus, 91 plums on a branch 15 inches long, and get this 32 stalks and a pound of grain from one kernel of Norway oats. Man, that doesn't happen. I don't know what that is, but you guys probably do. Anyway, okay, so 1872, an estimated 200 acres under cultivation, but it didn't take long for that to be over. 
Another thing going on, vegetable oil being made here on the Alameda's far west end. There's this place, uh, if you go to uh, Alameda Point, there's a spot where nothing is built on and nothing grows. It's just like a big empty dead spot. That's where this thing used to be. Um, where the, uh, the uh, it's the birthplace of Chevron, believe it or not. This thing called the Alameda Oil Works opened in 1868 to make vegetable oil from the copra and kukui nuts of uh, Hawaii. And the guy who was involved in this, Samuel Orr, oddly enough, is the brother-in-law of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, the fellow who wrote Treasure Island. Okay, so, I mean, how random is that? It turns out that Robert Louis Stevenson stopped here in Alameda uh, to, to fill his boat for his trip to the South Pacific. Uh, and he, it's known that he used Alameda dairies to fill his, his Casco, the ship Casco with, uh, with milk. So anyway, this eventually this Pacific Coast Oil Company becomes Standard Oil, then it becomes Chevron and they make everything from kerosene to a dark green lubricating oil there uh, eventually in uh, Alameda's more industrial times. So anyway, was, as we leave the 19th century, let's reflect on what we left behind. Uh, the tree fruits, the, the vine fruits and veggies, the, the berries, the veggies, the roots, the grains, they're all there. All that stuff used to grow here. It's pretty impressive. I'm sure some of you are growing some of this stuff now. Um, but you know, just give me a minute to read it. I'm sure it's, uh, it's all very lovely. And then of course, uh, the animals that were grown here, uh, you know, just uh, that's part of agriculture as well. So um, I love the, the, the quote, everyone raised chickens. Um, and uh, the, the dairies are kind of interesting. I mentioned um, birds dairy is the one where uh, uh, on the far west end where uh, Stevenson uh, filled his boat. Uh, there was a Burries, I don't know too much about. Fernside was an active dairy and there was the Alameda Creamery on the corner of Santa Clara and Webster uh, that was actually actively producing uh, cheese and cream and milk for the public to buy. Um, but uh, pretty soon uh, Alameda started taking on its uh, more uh, urban lifestyle and in 1872 herding in the public streets was already outlawed. I mean, come on. And then 1887, the residents were complaining that cows, sheep, and goats were eating their landscaping. So at that point, you know, yeah, the days of the cows in Alameda were coming to a close. And uh, just for the record, this is uh, my buddy, Will Rodriguez. Uh, I took this photo soon after this calf was born. Uh, pretty interesting moment. Luckily, he was not injured in the taking of this photo. Okay, um, the, uh, the Dahlia City was uh, a nickname that Alameda had for a time. It had a whole slew of nicknames, not just the Island City, but one of the many is the Dahlia City. And clearly these quotes um, give you an idea as to why. They grow in profusion in the city. Most prolific prize winners in the large Dahlia shows are grown in Alameda. Scores of other blooms are also to be seen um, while houses are partially hid from view by the gorgeous flowering vines such as the wisteria, climbing roses, and others. That's according to Polk's Oakland, Berkeley, and Alameda City Directory of 1925. Um, and in 1906, I have a note of Mrs. Edna Spencer moves to Alameda with her husband and children, cultivates a thousand acres with dahlias. I don't know if that's real. I mean, soon they have five city lots planted our exclusive commercial supplier to an Oakland florist. Mrs. Spencer wins honors at 1915 Pan Pacific Exposition for dahlia exhibit. And that's according to the University of California Journal of Agriculture that seems like it's gotta be real thousand acres of dahlias. Anyways, uh, up in the top right corner of uh, Alameda now, the Tidal Canal cut through their property. Lincoln Avenue would be cut through their property, but uh, the Cohens were a very influential family in this town, primarily because they made urban Alameda possible with the arrival of this railroad right here in 1864. 
um, the San Francisco and Alameda Railroad actually would become part of the Transcontinental Railroad for a little time, one of Alameda's biggest brushes with history. And certainly if that railroad hadn't been here, it wouldn't nearly have grown to the size that it did. And eventually Alameda would have two, the South Pacific Coast Railroad running down Encinal Avenue. And so as Alameda became more urbanized, uh, it squeezed out the farms. But Mr. Cohen never really wanted it to be that way. He, it, oddly enough, while he made urban Alameda happen, he wanted Alameda to stay rural. He wanted it to stay, you know, different than San Francisco. He wanted it to be this place for wealthy landowners to come, you know, kick back and take it easy and not have to worry about things like fire departments and sewers and urban trappings like that. So he had his big old estate where he tried to keep urban growth away and it just came right up on him, completely surrounded him and his kids. And this, uh, actually I don't have a picture of Alfred A. Cohen, the, the railroad baron, but I do have a picture of his, uh, of his son, Edgar Cohen here. Um, and Edgar is the one who's been taking all these pictures that we've seen. Um, he was a really accomplished photographer and we're lucky to have a few of his photo books. He even gets down to telling you like when he took the picture and what the f-stop was and everything on his camera, which is pretty more than you ever need to know, but it's pretty awesome. So anyway, uh, his father, A. Cohen, listed himself in the census as a horticulturist, not as a railroad baron, oddly enough, horticulturalist. So he thought of himself as a gentleman farmer, even though he was a railroad lawyer uh, and then a railroad owner. Um, he still thought of himself as just, you know, this country gentleman with this massive mansion, a bowling alley and a, a gallery and the whole bit. But he also had a, a full active um, dairy. And so let's take a look at some, some of these pictures from Edgar. So here's Edgar chopping wood, um, you know, taking down those trees, <laughs> those pesky trees. And um, the uh, the kids, these are these are Edgar's kids now, and he named his his son after his grandpa. So that's Alfred B. Cohen, um, and uh, his daughter Beatrice on the mule in Fernside. And this is 1898. These photos come from um, Colton and the corral at Fernside. These are some more from the back pasture, which I believe was the part that kind of like reached over towards San, San Leandro Bay, um, cow sheds in the back pasture. And just keep in mind that like while the rest of the peninsula is urbanizing and those Victorian houses are showing up on block after block after block, uh, Fernside is staying like this for, uh, for a couple more decades. And so you have the, the barn owls, you've got uh, the proud turkey, a native son, you got Beatrice in the garden. I'm not sure what she's up to over there. She's got, looks like she's got the pots on her head. I don't know. Um, pine trees near the beet patch. And then of course, there we are with ABC, Alfred B. Cohen, coming through the rye. And so uh, the rye, I'm, I'm not sure what you do with rye. You make bread out of it, right? I don't know. You make whiskey out of it, right? I don't know. So um, they had that much rye going on in Fernside, which today many, you know, people live in. And a couple other odd pictures from Alfred's, uh, from Edgar's uh, albums. Um, we have, this is uh, Santa Clara Avenue cut through the mound. So this is Santa Clara and Mound Street, <laughs> approximately 1898. Um, just notable because of the Indian shell mound that was once here um, that uh, was uh, obliterated by the streetcar coming through. You can see the, you can see the rails for the streetcar coming through. Um, bridge across the slough in East Alameda, there was actually a separate little island on the east end and uh, Edgar had this, uh, caught this picture of the bridge over to that extra little piece. I don't know. That's just an amazing thing. If you study early maps of Alameda, that, that photo is really, really interesting. Anyway, sorry. Um, and then, uh, okay, so the, in the Victorian era, and uh, just want to point out, you know, just for the record that the Victorian era spans 
very long period. And during that time, there were several styles of architecture that fall into the Victorian era. I always like to make that point. But one of the other things about building a proper Victorian home was to have a proper garden around it. And uh, well, I tried my best to find good pictures of Alameda places, I really couldn't. None of these are really of Alameda, but it gives you the idea that um, they wanted their houses arranged in, uh, you know, a kind of proper nature, you know, like an organized nature. And in this map from 1888, you can see that the way Alameda would develop is that you'd have maybe one or two buildings associated with a family, um, or, uh, and then the, they would own the whole rest of the block and not really do anything with it. Um, in other cases, they might just hold the lot next to them. And uh, the lot next to them, in the case of the Myers house on Alameda Avenue, the, the lot next to them was their garden. It's called the Myers House and Gardens for a reason. I don't know. But uh, yeah, and also the Party Home Museum in Oakland. If you've never been there, it's a really awesome resource in Oakland. Um, and uh, this, is, this is exactly how it looks today. And their uh, side lot is, uh, you know, it's a very important part of the Victorian home. So uh, when you're going around Alameda, you can sometimes see, and this is from Google Maps near my house over here near Franklin Park. And you can see this tall Victorian next to a squat bungalow. And it's clearly to my idea that this, this piece once belonged to this landowner and was sold off. That, that could have been a Victorian garden at some point. And this is just uh, a, uh, uh, an idea that, uh, you know, when folks ran out of money, they would sell their, their, their side lot off and subdivide their, their block. And that's partly how Alameda grew. And of course, like the, one of the things that happened during the Victorian era is this collecting uh, artifacts and collecting things from around the world. And this definitely extended to their gardens. And so in Victorian gardens, you're gonna see a lot of ferns there and palm trees. And these were different kinds of crazes that happened as part of the collecting. Um, and again, um, this isn't necessarily Alameda, but it does give you the idea that uh, the palm tree is a status symbol. So when, when I talked about the palm tree method, if you go around town and there's some kind of like non, undis, you know, what is this palm tree doing here? If you look back in time, it's probably the indicator of some kind of a, a state owner, or some kind of especially uh, interesting historical figure, I guess you could say. Um, but uh, we'll see that, more of that in just one minute. But this pter pterodiomania, fern fe fever, um, I don't know, for some reason, the fern definitely gives me a feel of like, I don't know, that Victorian sort of uh, sensibility, I don't know. But then of course, this kind of like thing became like a little spooky. And I think this is part of what drove Victorians out of style um, is keeping these old strange artifacts around and then your house gets a little run down and then suddenly you're living in that haunted house down the street. But um, anyway, but the thing about the palm tree is <laughs> Here's a perfect example from Alameda, Haight Avenue, 4th Street. What stood here in 1888? Well, a governor's mansion. Interestingly enough, uh, that fine fellow, not so fine fellow, <laughs> just Henry Huntley Haight lived right there. And that palm tree is likely a vestige of his Victorian era landscaping that still stands there. And this drawing from 1888 shows this, this fence, like he attempted to fence in his property with trees there on the, on the West End. Now this bend here is approximately where Central Avenue bends at Ensignal High School. And this would be the early uh, Newport Bass. Is that right, Chuck? I think so. Um, yeah. And uh, one of the earliest bathing resorts um, that came about because of the the railroad. Okay, so west of Webster, uh, we had the, this is a 1939 aerial map of existing farms still out there. Uh, this, this would be Main Street. So this is out, you know, in early, uh, like the, the little stub of Alameda Point before it was fully reclaimed. 
And um, the uh, there's this story about the North Shore and the Italian gardeners coming to town, like, uh, and and also on the West End having Italians growing uh, uh, successfully with uh, innovative styles of irrigation. And it says here, for a good many years, the Italian gardens leased for an average of $40 an acre were cultivated, cultivated by newly arrived Italian workers fed and housed on the premises. They lived comfortably and kept the best of stock, their horses being best cared for on the West End. They were reputed never to drink water, saying, we want all the water for our cabbages. The employers crushed 10 tons or more of grapes every year, making enough claret for themselves and their employees, just so that they wouldn't have to drink the water. Um, and uh, also on the West End, um, we had these interesting tenant farmers. So yeah, so you'd have like a rich landowner, like this fellow Davenport, um, or maybe, uh, you know, somebody who owned the property that the Italians would end up actually working on uh, would be the wealthy landowner. They wouldn't actually, the guy's name who's on the map is not the guy who did the farming. Uh, it's even a quote that I had from, one, from uh, this lady who knew Dolly McCartney, uh, Amos McCartney's wife, and she, she would say it was the browner people that did the farming. Um, but anyway, in this case, um, John uh, London, uh, for a, a Civil War veteran, as you can tell from his GAR medal, had fallen on some far, hard, harder times and he was working as a tenant farmer for Mr. Davenport who owned land on the West End. And that was a, a place where John, Jack London uh, grew up for a time, attending the West End school there. Um, also this famous building at uh, Webster and Central, many people think of it as Kroll's, but this is originally the Britt family's farmhouse. And the Britt family farmed acreage across the street, we believe, right on the waterfront where the waterfront used to be. And what would later be Neptune Gardens uh, was some of their uh, original acreage. Um, Neptune Gardens, of course, the forerunner to Neptune Beach and, you know, uh, the whole uh, South Shore bathing culture. But that's a topic for another um, okay, so north of Lincoln, uh, this is also, oh, this is where the 10 tons of grapes story comes in also. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, uh, apparently there was something like 100 Chinese gardeners who, who reclaimed marshland here on the North Shore. So this is the estuary you're looking at. Um, and I think approximately, well, this would all become the, the Del Monte and Little John Park. Um, and the thing about it is that the Chinese reclaimed it from the marsh and then promptly uh, had it taken over um, because they were only, in their culture, they were only allowed to lease land even in, in America, or maybe that was America's restrictions. Uh, I have to read more about it. Um, I, I need to learn more about, it, I guess, our racist history. But um, the thing is, uh, um, yeah, so they were just kind of squeezed out, even having done the work to actually reclaim the land, um, which was also the case out on Bay Farm. We know for a fact that McCartney used um, a, a Chinese work gang to uh, build the riprap barrier and then dry out the land and that he could eventually use for farming. So, um, yeah, and uh, I guess as uh, the automobile slowly takes over in the 20s, um, Park Street Strawberry Patch that I explained um, was uh, uh, where Mr. Panko started that strawberry patch that um, eventually would turn into uh, this area that was known as Auto Row for a time. There was Good Chevrolet, Ron Good Toyota, there was Cavanaugh, uh, Chevrolet when I first, not Chevrolet, uh, what's the other one? Whatever, you know what I mean. Chrysler, uh, that, they were all here. And Alameda had its own little like auto area. And the reason why it had that area to, to grow was because for the longest time, it was that strawberry patch. And the, the more urban part of Park Street was further south and the north of Lincoln, now as the city of Alameda designated that area as some specific part of Park Street north of Lincoln. And that became that way because uh, 
because the, the, stra the strawberries just defined the use differently. So um, that, that, air, that land became available for the new use of automobiles. Okay, so getting to the last of the subdivisions here, squeezing out the last of the farms. Um, 1938, it's getting hard to find a farm around here. Um, and these are just some of the stories of the ends of the farms. Like in 1879, we have a senator, we have a state senator laying uh, Versailles through a 20 acre tract of vegetable gardens. Uh, 1890s, the Almines are already whining that their forest is gone. Like, uh, Wow, that, that was fast, 40 years. Uh, Fernside developed in the 1920s, uh, you know, it's gone. It's now, it's streets. And um, the last unforested area west of Webster became government housing um, as part of the uh, war effort, certainly, and related to Alameda Point. All right, so just one other concept, but Bay Farm's still out there. Um, it, it was always, it was Bay Farm Island. It was the island that became a peninsula while Alameda is the peninsula that became an island. Oh, interesting. But uh, Bay Farm was known as Asparagus Island. In fact, Jack London refers to it that way in several of his short stories. And um, one, it's, uh, yeah, my little joke there. But the fact of the matter is, Woody Miner turned me on to this idea that uh, Bay Farm was kind of like the beginning of this huge agricultural resource that was the entire East Bay. Um, from the peaches on Peach Street to Asparagus Island, the cherries and the cherry festival in San Leandro, uh, everything from salt to grapes to olives and stone fruit. Um, and I don't know, for some reason I felt like putting some asparagus ice cream on here for you guys just to inspire, you know, anything's possible. Um, okay, so um, yeah, and of course the Rattos are the, the last holdout, and um, the Benny Ratto in particular here was the last to farm on Bay Farm Island, and this photo from a uh, newspaper in 1890, um, I'm sorry, 1980, <laughs> is uh, showing the, the end of farming in Alameda, really. The Ratto brothers moved out to the uh, the Central Valley, and um, these are just uh, some of the images now. And this uh, this jumping back to 1939 here with this aerial, um, you can see clearly here the 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 ear or the what do you call it the crops or whatever the the parcels of land that have have been uh, planted whatever. And then, of course, this is the, the huge section of marsh that McCartney reclaimed. That was all McCartney's land, but wasn't really used until Ron Cowan showed up in the, uh, in the 70s and started making his plans for uh, Harbor Bay. The golf course was there as of uh, 1920. Oh, it was a big history of this Alameda gym. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And... Um, uh, yeah, one early subdivision here. Some of the oldest homes on Bay Farm are here. Um, but uh, anyway, so I just find it interesting to see those farms actually in existence now. So um, anyway, some funny, uh, yeah, this is a funny um, Kingswell uh, cartoon from back in the day that they were going to turn the old Ratto farm into genetic engineering research, but I don't think that you guys probably live there now. Anyway, so interesting building on Bay Farm um, ties in with the, uh, the, the Portuguese farmers, the many Portuguese families that uh, lived and grew out there in the 20th century more. And actually some of them were there before that. But um, the, anyway, the Silva Farmhouse, one of the last surviving uh, structures that was like related to the farm era. So the Silva Farmhouse, uh, 19... 48, it's on like Oleander or something like that. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because there's, you know, these townhomes all around it, and Harrington Park on one side. But Harrington Park used to be the acres that they farmed. And um, the fact that this building stood while those acres were farmed makes me feel like this is a historic structure. And even though it dates to 1948. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so it's the last surviving structure related to the farm. I'm not, it's not the oldest building on Bay Farm. I'm not saying that because the, the little subdivision I described next to the golf course is older. But this is a farm related building. Um, so anyway, um, these are just some of the, the families, um, long standing families that uh, were farming out on Bay Farm uh, after this, this sort of gold rush era. Of course, uh, Victory Gardening kind of like made a big comeback. Um, I just find it interesting um, how they described it here. So like the big industrial farmers were not gonna grow your fancy vegetables. So um, they were gonna grow things that, I don't know, I guess were more industrialist, industrially significant, more had more of an impact on the war effort. They wanted you to grow whatever you found tasty at your own home garden. So dig for victory and uh, grow your own. Um, so that was like an interesting concept about the victory garden. Now, none of these are, are really uh, from Alameda. I did somewhere, I tracked down an Alameda victory garden picture and I don't think this is it. Uh, and I don't think I ever put it in the show. Sorry about that. I'll have to dig that out. I don't know where it is. Oop, dig it out, get it, all right. Anyways. Um, yeah, but there was a victory garden in the shadow of San Francisco City Hall and also uh, apparently downtown or something. So anyways, um, the other things about victory gardens, I found some cool pictures. Um, and I just wanted to point out that you guys can win the next war now just by gardening. And I wanna encourage you to do that. Um, <laughs> with home canning and home drying, the National War Garden Commission of Washington DC encourages you to win the next war now. And also in case you didn't heard, uh, your, yeah, your garden is also a munition plant. Um, plant more beans, help feed those freed from access rule. And actually that's, that's kind of like who my grandparents were who came and grew their garden here in America. So anyway, um, these are our today's gardeners. Um, Nod back to Iris Watson, who once had uh, Anson, uh, Thompson's Nursery, right? And uh, the Backyard Growers, you guys yourselves, you guys were part of it. And the Plowshares Nursery, the Anson All Nursery, it's still going on. And so anyway, this will wrap up the show. And I just encourage you guys to support me and the Alameda Sun and possibly buy one of these fine titles. <laughs>